As we move into uh, 2017, uh, I wanna speak uh, not to your problem, but to your answer tonight. Uh, I, I, I love Jesus, I've gotta tell you. Uh, I've, I've been a Christian uh, a number of years now, and when I met Jesus, my life so dramatically changed uh, that for the last 30 something years, it has always been a true passion of mine to wake up every day knowing that He found me, that He saved me, that He loved me, that He died for me. Uh, and I wanna, I wanna express the heart of God towards you tonight. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're going through some problems or some issues, God's got a plan to get you to the other side. Uh, and many people, uh, many times people go through really hard times and challenges and it's almost like their life can turn to dust. Well, I wanna tell you tonight, you'd be amazed at what God can do with dust. Uh, he, he, he took the dust of the earth and He created humankind. And uh, in your challenges and your, uh, your things that you're going through, there's a hand and a plan of God to equip us to take us to another level. So I've called tonight's message, uh, by generosity, we stand. By generosity, we stand. The book of Isaiah, chapter 32, verse eight says this, but a generous man devises great things or generous plans. And by His generosity, He shall or we shall stand. Generous people devise, consider, think about, contemplate how they can be a blessing to other people, uh, how they can help others, how they, how they can make somebody's life better off. Always looking for opportunity, to opportunities consciously or subconsciously to make a difference in somebody's life. Even in a, gener a generosity person's mind, whether it be a, a seemingly like a, a random act of generosity is actually a, a device because of it happens out of their belief system. So it can look very random, but a generous person can't help themselves. And in other words, it mightn't be planned in their head, but it's already planned in their heart. In other words, they're always considering how their life, how their world, what they have can make a difference in somebody's life. And, and then when they have opportunity, they step into it. Too many believers are trying to get out of things rather than trying to get into things. We've gotta be not those group that's trying to, well, I, I can't get, no, no, we wanna make sure we get into all that God's called us to do. The church. And be assured, and I, I see myself as a reasonably generous person. I love the concept, the idea of it. But even sometimes uh, when it comes our way, we can battle or, or fight to live out of our belief system. I was in um, the US about two years back and, and it was around Christmas time and I'd seen this pair of uh, guest boots uh, in, in, a, in a guest shop that I really loved. They were about 400 bucks. And, um, so I thought, I'll just try this Ross store because this Ross store has all the big brands at really cheap prices. And I'm thinking, God's with me, uh, something's gonna happen. So I walk into this Ross store and I'm looking through all the shoe section and I find the exact pair of boots. They're guests, they're brand new and they're not $400, they're $65. So I'm, I'm thinking, Jesus loves me. I'm thinking, this is awesome. Anyway, so I pick up my boots, I'm happy, I get to the checkout, $65, not $400, I'm loving it, I'm smiling. And then as I get there, I'm waiting in the line and these people next to me, there was, um, there was a grandmother, a mother and some children and I was listening to their conversation and uh, they'd had a trolley full of presents and toys and all sorts of things for Christmas. And, and, uh, but as they were talking, I, I heard them say, you know, obviously we can't afford all of this and, we can only choose certain things. And the mother's speaking to the grandmother and looking at the kids saying, well, we can't give them everything we want. Um, so what we'll do, they said, we'll just, we'll just get to the total of what we can afford and we'll put the other stuff back. And as I'm hearing this, I'm excited about my boots and God starts to speak to me. He starts to say, you know what? Maybe you should pay for all of those presents. That whole trolley full. And I'm going, man, I just got my boots. I just saved 300 bucks. I'm excited. I don't want to spend any extra money. Man, this is awesome. Anyway, I, I, I'm not a pushover with God. I stand my ground. I'm not that easily convinced. It could have been the devil. I got to make sure of these things. You can't just wander off. No. Anyway, I picked up my boots. I walk out of the store. I'm feeling good for about 10 seconds. I walk back into the store put my boots on the table. The people are still red, doing their registered thing with this uh, mother and grandmother. And they were about to say, look, we can't do anymore. I said, excuse me. And they looked at me and I said, yes. And I said, uh, do you love Jesus? And I said, well, yes, we do. We, we're, we're believers, we go to a church down the road. I said, really? I said, well, God must really love you. 
I said, why is that? He said, because he sent a preacher all the way from Australia to be your Father Christmas. God spoke to me and He told me to pay for everything in that trolley. They said, everything? I said, everything. <laughs> and the checkout girls looking at me going, what the, what is, you know, like going, I said, ring it up. And I just kept listening, ding, 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 ding. She said, you wanna know what it is? I said, nope. I took that receipt and I said, God bless you, have an awesome Christmas. Now, I was a lot poorer, but I was feeling a whole lot better. I was feeling like, you know what, I can make a difference in somebody's life. So I took my boots, still feeling good about life. I got home, showed Lee my boots, she hated them. <laughs> she said, they're terrible boots, Mark. They don't. I said, oh, okay. So what I did without telling Lee is I, I gave them to my son, Joel, all right? So I thought, well, I'll just give them to Joel. And so Joel wearing them at church the next Sunday and my wife, Lee, looks at him and says, Joel, I love your boots. <laughs> what does that say? I'm the dork of the fam. What does that say? That on Joel, they're cool. Generous people, generous spirits, they, it makes a difference in your life. So I, I, I think that great Christianity is characterised by great generosity. That's how we can really tell we've been set free uh, from fear and, and from the things that hold us back is when we can walk out of that store happy knowing it's cost us more than we thought. In other words, we need to be not just ready uh, to be generous, but willing to be generous as well. And uh, so I wanna look at this, this Scripture. The first part goes on generous uh, people devise generous plans. But the second part, it says this, by His generosity, He will stand. By His generosity, He will stand. In other words, He won't fall down. He will keep going. They shall overcome. They shall break through. So one of the, the great principles of success and breakthrough is generosity. It's, it's a strange concept, but it's a very powerful one. Uh, and not only is it a success principle, it is one of the most undervalued weapons against darkness is generosity. Uh, we understand intercession, we understand prayer, prophecy, declaration, but what we don't see is the power to push back the way of the enemy by through our love and through our generosity. By generosity so powerful against the devil and his plans to steal, to kill and destroy. And it's something we should engage only, not when we're just going well, but generosity should be the heartbeat of who we are, whether things are good or whether things are bad. Because it's by our generosity, we shall stand. In other words, we, we can have a generous heart and be upbeat about God when things are going well, but when things get tough, we can pull back from the very thing we need to do, to keep loving, to keep serving to keep trusting God. Even though the outcomes aren't looking this good at the moment, I wanna tell you, it's in those times you start to de develop a spiritual power around you that pushes back the enemy. See, generosity is the power and foundation of resurrection. Generosity is the power and foundation of resurrection. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, not just to die, but to rise again from the dead. He gave, and in that act of generosity, He changed the whole spiritual climate of our planet. It was the love and generosity of God that pushed back and destroyed the works of darkness. Generosity is our way to resurrection. It's when you keep that generous spirit around you when you're under attack, when you're being beaten down, when things aren't going your way, the Word of God is not exactly how it's happening for you right now. In that place, if you can trust the Bible, Generous people will stand by their generosity. That's the power of darkness. It pushes darkness and it destroys the plans of the enemy for your life. He, really, he, he was finished, we, we had him down. Nobody got back up again. But, but, but we had him done, nobody got back up again. You see, uh, the devil doesn't fear perfect people. He fears resurrected people. People that should have stayed down, people that should have given up, but they got back up and loved again. They got back up and and gave again. They got back up and decreed the goodness of God. Those who keep loving and giving cannot be stopped. 
They cannot be stopped. The enemy has no power and no way to bring them down. By his generosity, by your generosity, by your love, you shall stand. Generosity empowers you, it blesses God, and it changes lives. It empowers you, it blesses God, and it changes lives. So tonight, I wanna go quickly over three major effects of generosity. The first thing about generosity you need to know tonight is that generosity makes a way where there seems no way. It makes a way. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 16, it says this, a man's gift makes room for him. In another translation, it says, a man's gift makes a way for him and brings him before great men. By his generosity, he will stand. Your gift, your generosity makes a way. Giving is such a part of God's character that it carries supernatural power. Giving and general is such a part of who God is, His character, that it carries supernatural power. Understand what the word supernatural means. Supernatural or the word super or the prefix super means above. So when we talk about supernatural, we're talking above natural. There are natural laws and then there are above natural laws. It seemed to even go against the natural law, but they are supernatural laws. So when we evoke a supernatural law, we don't destroy science, we go to a higher level. We go to a higher place. Like for example, our gravity is a a natural law. You know if I jump, I'm not gonna float. Even if you diet, you're not gonna float. Why? Because that's a natural law. But there is a higher law, the law of aerodynamics and flight that if you evoke that law and understand that law, you will go above the law of gravity. Now you've not destroyed science, you've just invoked, invoked a higher law to take place, the law of flight, it's like a bird. Man, it, 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 it's got life in it and it's aerodynamically designed, so it defies, man, it defies the law of gravity. It takes off, it flies through the air. But if you <coughs> shoot that bird, <laughs> and you take away the higher law, the lower law comes in, gravity. Mm, In other words, there is a supernatural law that we can get into that will abide or go beyond the natural laws you and I are used to. This is the why when we say God is a supernatural God, it's not as though He destroys science, He just goes above the natural laws and things. So a supernatural event is one that supersedes or goes above the natural laws that we usually see around our place. Giving and generosity activate the supernatural law of increase. Giving and generosity activate, they go beyond the natural law and they evoke a supernatural law because it's such the character and the very heart of God. Look in Proverbs 11 verse 24 and 25. It says, there's one who scatters, get what? He increases more. And there's one who withholds more than that is right, but that leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich and he who waters will also be watered himself. Now, in the natural, that doesn't make sense. If, if you scatter, you should have less. If you withhold something, then you should have more. But when you understand the power and the character of God, and He goes above a natural law, He evokes a supernatural law through generosity and giving. Now the opposite takes place. Those that scatter shall increase more. Those who withhold and more than that is right. So it's not even wrong to have, but it's wrong to hold on to more than that is right. And that takes us to a place then of now we'll have less than what we should have. That's the nat- supernatural law of God. Don't think that generosity somehow releases you or downgrades you, it takes you to a new place. When we pray, and Pastor Chris said it, that the prayers of righteous men and women avail much. The natural law is, if you're sick, you're gonna get sicker, but we can evoke a higher law, the law of healing, because of the character and the nature of God. It's the same principle. And yet we seem to get it there, but we need to get it through the context of generosity. So when you're generous and you give and you love and you care, you will not have, you know what? You will not have less of anything. You'll become more of everything because you evoke a higher standard, a higher law, the supernatural law of God. And it's not, 
Generosity and giving is not just something you do. It's a wrong concept to think it's all about doing something. It's actually the spirit of something or the condition of a soul. It's what's happened inside a human that makes him generous, not the act that you see on the outside. In uh, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, it says this, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. A prospering soul or a generous soul is what gives you strength and help. I pray that you be in good health and strong. I know that will be if your soul is prospering. A generous soul will be made rich. We just read that. And through their generosity, they, you, will stand against no matter what comes your way, there is a way to overcome that thing. You know, as, as we look, we got a, a testimony in of um, a family that, that was so financially broke, so messed up, their, their, their prayer to us was, in big capital letters, there is no way, no way out of this. That's what they wrote. But they said, you know what happens when you get to the place there's no way? You start to put your trust and faith in the way. And when you put your faith and trust in the way, the no way starts to move out of the way. And the way that God has for you starts to unfold. The, the end of that testimony is that there was no way. So we went to the way. Now it's out of the way. And God has blessed us abundantly now and set up things in the future. You can, you can live a natural life if you want. You go right ahead. But I wanna tell you, when you start to realise the power that lies in the supernatural things of God, wow, the laws that, are, uh, uh, that are, we can get amongst and understand to see the power and the wonder of God come and transform the way that we do life. It's about your soul. A generous soul will be made rich. And by their generosity, they will stand. A generous soul cannot be kept down. They, you can't stop them. In good times or in bad, the generous soul doesn't change their attitude to giving. They don't change because it's a good time or a bad time. They understand that it's through their generosity they will stand. It's their power to stand up and to keep standing. In um, Genesis chapter 39, we're gonna read it one through four. It's a perfect example of this taking place. Uh, taking place. Taking place. Um, Joseph uh, is, comes from, you think you've got a dysfunctional family? They are a one messed up family. Let's read it, 39 verses one through four. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites. So in other words, his family hated him. He had a dream in his heart and he started to tell them about the dream. His family hated, they started, decided to kill him. And one of the brothers said, no, let's not kill him. Uh, let's sell him off <laughs> into slavery, all right, and uh, make some money. Uh, and so they bought him off the Ishmaelites and taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph and he was, the Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man. Now contextualise that. He's just been thrown out by his family. He's been beaten and robbed. He owns nothing. He has no possessions, no family, no relationships. He's now been sold into slavery. He is surrounded by rich people in jewels and fur coats and the latest camels. And in amongst all of that, God says, he's a successful man. He's a success, but why? He's got nothing. You can't keep a generous spirit down. You can't stop them, it doesn't matter what you put them through, they will stand up, they will pop back to the service. He was a successful man in the house of the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord made him all did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favour in his sight and served him. And then he made him the overseer of his house and all that he had was put under his authority. So this man who had nothing, no clothes, no background, no identity, no, no family, no possessions, was now thrown in as a slave. And because his attitude never changed towards generosity, you know what he did? He said, this is where I am, I'm gonna serve to the best I can be. He served that master. No, it wasn't fair that he was a slave. It wasn't fair that this had happened in his family. It wasn't fair that that was the background of his life. But right here, right now, in the good times and the bad, he wasn't gonna change his perspective on generosity. He says, you know what, if this is my lot, I'm gonna serve. I'm gonna give. I'm gonna give it my best. And then it says, he rises to a place. Now he's not just serving the house of Potiphar, he's running the house of Potiphar. 
he's doing so good. Man, he's kicking it. Potiphar's wife, man, she looks at this young, good looking boy, calls him into the bedroom to make the bed and rub a neck. And, 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 and he goes, hey, sorry, I, I, I'm not there, thanks, but you know what, I'm good. And she gets so upset that she, he, he defies her. He, she yells out, rape, I've been raped by the young boy. So now he's thrown into jail. Did he deserve it? No, he did the right thing. You ever been thrown into jail or into a mess and he did the right thing? It shouldn't have happened that way. You shouldn't have been beaten up. You shouldn't have been thrown out by your family. You mean, you did the right things and da, da 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 and yet you still end up in a bad spot. Now he's in jail. He's got every right to be angry at God. He's got every right. I was doing the right thing. I said no to the girl. And yet this is where it ended up. But not, not Joseph. Because of his generous spirit, he said, you know what? If I'm in jail, I'm gonna serve. I'm in jail. I'm gonna serve. I'm gonna give my best. And if you know the story, he ends up in a very short term, what? Running the jail. You can't stop him. You can't put a generous person down. They'll keep loving, they'll keep caring, they'll keep serving, and God will just keep lifting them up to the top. They are the best floating devotion in the world. And if you know the rest of the story, not only does he run the jail, the Pharaoh of the greatest nation on the earth hears about him. And very soon, this person who was nothing, a nobody with nothing, but in God's eye, a successful man was now running the most powerful nation on the planet. You can't keep a generous person down. You can't stop them. And this is what I mean. This this is where we undervalue the power of generosity as a spiritual weapon. We we, 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 We can like the prophet in the deck, and it's all good. But there is a power in a heart or a soul that's generous that destroys the works of the devil around them. Joseph had a general soul. It's what you do, listen to this, it's what you do in the bad seasons that releases the good seasons that come your way. It's what you do in the bad seasons, in the jail, in the pit, all right, in the slavery, in the addiction. It's in the things you do in the bad season that now starts to release the supernatural power of God to bring the good seasons your way. By your generosity, you will stand. You won't lose. You won't be put down. You will stand up. Second thing about generosity tonight is that generosity forges great relationships. Generosity forges great. And don't be confused. Relationships are the most important thing that you own. I wanna tell you what gets you into heaven, not that you know about God, but that you know God. It's all about relationship. At the end of your life, you're never gonna decree or decry, man, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. It'll always be, I wish I'd been with the people who I love the most. Your relationship with God is the number one relationship that you have. With yourself is another one. You've got you to come to terms with who you are. You've got to love the you that God made you to be. I know you're not as good looking as me, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> You've got to come to terms with the you that God made. That's such an important relationship. You, you can't, you cannot compare yourself to anybody else on the planet because there's no one just like you. And if you try to compare with somebody else, you're always gonna fall short. There's always gonna be somebody that's richer, more good looking, more muscle. I mean, it doesn't matter where you go, you can't compare. You must come to a place and say, you know what? On the back of the tag of my soul, it doesn't say made in China, made in Hong Kong or India. It says made in heaven. And when you get that clear, then this relationship becomes significant. Now you're in control of your life. Relationships are everything. And then relationship with other people. Listen, if you grow alone, you will grow weak and weird. (laughs) If you don't have somebody to speak into your life, you know, this is why God gives men wives. (laughs) Amen. We have wives in case the Holy Spirit decides to take a holiday that all things will be okay. You see, we need somebody to speak. And you know what? There is 20% of yourself you don't see, but others see. And I hate that. I hate that. 
I remember one time I was preaching and, and again, the wife's job is to when she's um, you know, uh, watching me preach is not to listen, but to tell me how I was doing wrong and what I need to fix and how I look. And she said, you know what you do? You, when you preach, Mark, you often scratch the top of your head. And I said, I do not. I said, that's not true. You can't prove that. She said, yes, you do. And I said, I'm telling you right now, it doesn't happen. In other words, we need people around us. Relationships are everything. God never left the disciple, He left the disciples. All right, everything's around, forged around, and generosity forges good relationships. Proverb 18, verse 16 again, the second part of the Scripture, and it says, your gift brings you before great men. Your generosity forges and strengthens relationships. You know, if you know the context of this story, it's the story of the Queen of Sheba. And um, at the time, Solomon was the wisest man on the earth. And so everybody from everywhere comes to see and listen to Solomon. There were, there were lines bigger than the Adele conference, I mean concert. You know, they, it went all the way back and around Africa and, and through Spain. And, um, and, and she's come to see or hear or listen to uh, the wisdom of King Solomon. She's in the line. But what happens is she brings a gift that's so big that's so extravagant, that's so ridiculously absurd that the word of her gift gets all the way back to the palace. And because of her gift, she bypasses the queue, gets the rubber stamp and goes in and sees King Solomon. It says, this gift will make a way for you. It will bring you before great men. In other words, your generosity in your spirit helps place you in position to build relationships that will take you into, their, into your future. Jesus was only on the planet three minutes before wise men, not stupid men, wise men turned up and laid gifts at His feet. Why did they do that? Why? why, why, why? Because He was important to their future. Wise men today still see the power of bringing their gift and their giving to the King of Kings. They still see it, why? Because it's important to our future. Ungenerous living destroys relationships in family, in marriage and in life and creates selfishness and isolation. If you're a ungenerous in your relationships, what a, I'll, let's stop talking about, that's enough about me. Let's talk about me. <laughs> if you're always that person where it's, you're the centre of attention, you're the, you're the ungenerous one in a relationship, it starts to break down into selfishness and isolation. Generous living empowers relationships with God, with man, and these are vital for our future. Be generous in your relationships. Speak well of one another. It's easy to find faults in people. I know a lot of you, I know all your faults. It's simple. But I, I don't look for your faults. I look for what God's got good in you. Yeah. I don't encourage you. I, I, I'm, not the, I'm not called to judge people. I'm called to love people. Yeah. And, and the way you build great relationships is to encourage and speak well of people, and uplift people. That's the power of God. That's the power of speech because your words create the world that you want to live in. It creates the world for other people to live in as well. So make sure that you're generous in your living. Generosity, by your generosity, you will stand because now you've built great relationships to stand with you in God and with those around you. And the third effect of generosity is that generosity releases your best future. It releases your best future. Do you know, do you know that your future will one day be your past? And that your past one day was your future? your future will turn up really quickly. And how it looks in the future will depend on what you do today. Right. It's not que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. It's not just, it's not just happenstance. You don't, you don't walk into a future, you create your future by what you do and what you believe. And generosity creates your best future. You see, don't judge your success only by what you receive or reap but also judge it by what you sow and what you give. The reason being 
is because reaping is the end of a season, sowing is the creating of a new season. And if you judge your success on what's coming in, you're misunderstanding that your past or your future is gonna become your past and you're missing out on the great season that's ahead of you. Be excited about what you're sowing just as much as about what you're receiving. You see, my future is not determined by your generosity, it's determined by mine. It's how I live, it's how I love, it's how I care, it's how I encourage. Whether it be giving love, mercy, encouragement, hard work or finance, it doesn't matter. I'm developing the future that I wanna walk into by the decisions I make today. What I'm gonna give, what I'm gonna sow into, what I'm gonna be generous. Galatians chapter six, verse nine, I think says it really well. It says, and let us not grow weary while doing good. Don't grow, you know every time somebody grew weary in the Bible, they end up in a mess. Did you know Samson, who could have been the person that changed history, grew weary and laid his head in the lap of Delilah and ended up being a person that God could no longer use. Do you know David grew weary of going to war, King David, so he stayed at home where he should have been with his men and he ends up in the bed of that girl, I can't think of her name. Bathsheba, Bathsheba, thank you. Your accent's killing me. I gotta listen to somebody else. Nothing personal, it's just that I'm going deaf. And Bathsheba, he ends up with Bathsheba and ends up in a mess. You know all the answers, though. that's my trouble. Someone is yelling out everything. Uh, and, I, and, and every time you grow weary of doing good, you put yourself in a tough situation. You put yourself in a perspective of a vulnerability. So it's, don't grow weary in doing good, why? For in due season, you shall reap if you do not lose heart. You shall reap if you do not lose heart. See, the Bible talks about due seasons and a due season is your future. Generosity creates the right one. That's the difference. Your due seasons are coming. <laughs> you can't stop them. You can't, they're coming your way. Your future's gonna turn up one day. What it looks like will depend on your generosity, your love, your care, your serving. Like Joseph, your commitment to being the best you can be. Giving is seeding. That's what giving is, it's seeding. And seeds are the things that fruit and harvest and increase come from. That's what a seed has in it. That's why we call money a seed because if you do the right thing with it, it has harvest, it has increase. You, you, you sow a seed. Uh, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and die, it remains alone. But if it plants or gives itself, there is much harvest. So giving is seeding. And they only bear increase, the seeds, when they're sown or planted, not because they're eaten or just kept. You know, um, I, I got a watermelon over here and somebody's machete. And this is the only time I get to play with deadly weapons in Australia. And uh, I've got a watermelon because I wanna show you something and I'm gonna cut this with one mighty swipe. And if I let it go, duck. <laughs> All right. A strange thing about getting this watermelon was really hard to get because I wanted a watermelon with black seeds in it. But in the days of modified fruit and vegetables, there's no black seeds in watermelons anymore. What a strange world we live in. But we'll do it anyway. I so want to do that again. No, I won't. It's all right. That has got to be the coolest machete I've seen for a long time. All right. Oh. Inside this watermelon, there's red flesh. You can see that's fairly obvious. Usually there's black seeds, but back in my day, there were black seeds in watermelons. Is that true, Caroline? There was black seeds. We used to have to spit them out. Annoying, but at least you knew they were real. This, I'm not sure where it came from or what it's made of, because it doesn't have a seed in it. Well, it has little white seeds, so I guess they will do. And so I guess the question I wanna pose to you tonight, and this is what I'm talking about, seeding and generosity. If I was to say, if to look at this melon, what's the most important thing in here? The red flesh, it tastes really good, it smells really good. Or the black seeds back in the day. 
You know, they, what would be the most? And some people go, well, of course, man, I'm hungry. It's looking good. I love the melon, on the flesh. That's more important. Others say, no, 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 no. I know seeds are important because without, yeah, and that's true. You know what? They're both just as important as each other. Because without the flesh, you die today. Without planting your seeds, you die tomorrow. Wow. So, so both are significant. So when the Bible talks about God giving us things, He understands that we're gonna use some things, gonna eat some things. It's a part of the plan of God that He gives us stuff for our own edification, our own fruitfulness. But then He goes on and gives us things like seeds that aren't ours. And if you eat them, you'll never have no food tomorrow. Your juice season won't end up being the right juice season that you wanted back. You see, today you eat, tomorrow you need seeds to keep eating. And so when I speak of generosity, we stand, you know, there's a group of islands called the Easter Islands of South America. And they had, were totally civilised and uh, had a lot of people living there for a long time, but they never understood about sowing seed. They just ate, they ate the island to death. They never planted, they never, they never renewed uh, uh, crops, they never renewed trees. And if you go to those islands today, there's a bunch of statues of what they worshipped, but there's not a tree left on the place and humanity died out there because all they did was eat the, eat the flesh and not worry about the seed. By generosity, you sow seeds. By giving, you plant in the Spirit. You activate the supernatural that goes above the natural laws and you will be a soul that prospers. By generosity, we make a way. We make a way for ourselves, but we also make a way for trafficked children to be rescued. When we're generous, we make a way for the addicted teenager to be set free. When we're generous, we make a way for the lost and broken adult that needs to find Jesus. So every time we're generous, it makes a way where there seems no way. Every time we, we live generously, we forge great relationships that build our future. And every time we're generous, we release due seasons, the right ones, not just for us, but for the people around us as well. By generosity, not only will you stand, but others will stand as well. Today, let's make sure that great Christianity is characterised by great generosity. And if we can live that way, you will, we will push back darkness from our nation. There will be a way to see the glory of God unfold at a higher level. And it starts with a generous soul.